Um, so, quick introduction. Um, I used to run the uh, equity research group at Morningstar. Uh, I started my own firm uh, about seven years ago. We were founded in 2014. We've compounded at about 18% since inception versus about 10% for our benchmark. Um, we're about 1.8 billion in assets under management right now. Six employees, uh, largely institutional clients, uh, endowments and foundation. Um, we're very concentrated. Uh, 10 to 15 positions uh, global. Uh, we can invest anywhere in the world. Though we are careful to only invest where we think uh, we have a competitive advantage. Uh, business, uh, air countries focus on businesses with economic modes and reinvestment problems. So not just companies that have some kind of competitive advantage, but that also have the opportunity to continue reinvesting that capital going forward. That's kind of going to be the, one of the main focuses of this presentation. Um, about 12 positions currently, with 40% um, of our capital in the top four positions. And um, our process emphasizes primary research and qualitative insights. This is really important because assessing competitive advantage is not just a matter of reading financial data. It's a matter of getting your hands dirty, getting out there, talking to customers, talking to ex employees, and really figuring out routes why customers will uh, allow a company. So that's something I want to talk about later in the, in the presentation. So we'll do a quick uh, background on sort of what creates a moat. So those of you who read any of my books may be familiar with this. But we'll go pretty quick. The primary test is pricing power, which is you know usually created via intangible assets, like a brand, or patents, or a license. Uh, switching costs, network effects, or cost advantage. There are some exceptions there where an Amazon or Costco might compete based on shared scale economies. Um, the general rule uh, that if a business does not have some kind of pricing power, probably doesn't have a moat. My view, why moats matter is that they increase business value. They lengthen the period where a company can reinvest capital at a high incremental rate of return. You know, very simply, you can just, for a longer period of time, it takes longer for returns on capital to decline down to cost of capital. And so the company can reinvest at an incrementally positive rate of return for a longer period of time. Moats also reduce business risk because they insulate the business from competition and exogenous shocks. And this is really important in the context of a concentrated portfolio, because if you have, if your average position is seven or eight and a big position is 12% versus two or 3%, those unexpected shocks can really hurt you. Uh, and so having the ability to have a business insulated from competition and unexpected shocks, again, you know, not completely insulated, but to have that risk reduced is very beneficial. And that's one reason why we focus on moats and why I think moats, uh, a focus on moats is especially uh, useful in a concentrated portfolio. Finally, moats can be inefficiently priced because a go forward evaluation of competitive advantage requires qualitative analysis. Um, you can't just click on Bloomberg and screen for switching costs. It doesn't work that way. You got to get out there and talk to people. And so because of that, because it requires real work from the analyst, well, a lot of the investment community doesn't do the work. And so if you do, you have the opportunity to develop a variant perception. So that's another reason why I think understanding moats and competitive advantage can be advantageous to the investor. And why reinvestment matters is that it maximizes the value of competitive edge. It lowers the risk of value destructive capital allocation. And we'll give a couple quick examples to help, help illustrate this a little bit. So company A, 20% returns on capital, pretty good, but you know maybe its end market isn't growing very much. And so it can only reinvest 30% of its cash flow. It only has the ability to reinvest 30% of its cash flow because you know it's selling candy, it's selling beer. You know, the market's only growing five or six percent a year. So 70% of its cash flow is being used for dividends, buybacks, and MA. Now, let's take a step back. Only a third of cash flow is actually earning that, you know. 20% rate of return that got you really excited about the business in the first place, assuming incremental return on capital, you know, equals cost of capital, of course. We also have the potential for value destruction because most repurchases, as we know, tend to be at overpriced levels. You have a, a small number of managers 
CEOs who do this well, but the vast majority of companies deploy more capital to reinvest when the markets are hot. And of course, we all know the track record of M&A, generally pretty poor. Again, some companies who focus on it do it really, really well, but most companies frankly don't. And of course, the income that's paid out to me, the investor, has to be redeployed in a public equity market. It might be taxed, and so then we have tax leakage, but then I've got to go out and compete with a whole bunch of other smart guys, some of, and women, some of whom you know, belong to CFA Society of India or other CFA societies, and redeploy that capital. And that's a much less efficient way of using that capital that the business is generating than just reinvesting it back in. So let's look at company B. Same return on capital, 20%, return on incremental capital. It reinvests 70% of its cash flow, right? The market is growing at a reasonably fast pace so that it's able, it has the capacity to continue reinvesting. The most logical thing to do with that capital is to reinvest. And so the bulk of the cash flow actually earns that 20% return on capital that got you excited about the business in the first place. And you have lower capital allocation risk because there's really one, two, well, this is two figures, because there's one choice, which is to reinvest the capital, right? Plow it back into this wonderful business that's earning 20% returns on capital. And critically, the return on that reinvestment is higher than what's typically achievable in public equity markets. Just take a step back and think about it. The set of companies with sustainable returns on capital above 20% is way larger than the set of equity managers, you know, yahoos like me, with long-term net returns above 20%. And if that's the case, then the most logical thing to do is to find the businesses that can keep reinvesting because the capital is going to compound at a higher rate than if they give it back to you and you've got to do something with it in a highly competitive equity market. That's, in my view, why reinvestment matters. So let's talk a little bit about analyzing reinvestment. Right. How do you think about whether this reinvestment is NPV positive? Because just because a company is reinvesting, it could be creating value or it could be setting the money on fire. One thing to ask yourself, is the investment incremental or fixed? Software and salespeople, this is incremental, right? You hire more marketing people, you stop hiring them. You hire more software developers, you stop hiring. But all the while that you're expanding, you're probably shipping code. You're probably shipping product and you're generating cash flow. You've got an actual functioning business. Whereas if what you're doing is building a giant giga, giga factory or launching a bunch of satellites up into the air, well, you don't generate any cash flow until that actually happens, right? And so that's a fixed investment. And of course, your drop through is really high once you get those satellites up in the air, or you finish the giga factory. But if it doesn't work, or there's a delay and you run out of cash, or maybe technology moves forward and obsolesces your original idea. This is what happened to Iridium and GlobalStar. Any of you remember those companies? They were gonna launch a whole bunch of low earth orbit satellites and have create a you know, global um, phone network for anywhere in the world that anybody was, but then cell phone technology advanced at a much faster rate and the phones were bulky and inconvenient and it was a lot easier just to pick up and use one of these things. Um, and so you know, they spent all this money launching these satellites and nothing worked. So usually incremental investments are much less risky than fixed, fixed investments. The corollary here is that fungible assets, people, are a lot easier to pivot than fixed assets if the original plan doesn't work, right? If you know, feature A in the software doesn't work, um, or if you're an engineering centric organization and the product you're designing isn't very good, you just start doing something different because people can do lots of different things. Whereas if you've invested a ton of capital in a factory that's just going to do one thing and then nobody really wants that thing, you're left with what's called a stranded asset. So again, reinvestment in a fungible asset is usually less risky than reinvestment in an asset that has what we call high specificity, right? It can only be used for one thing. And then you want to think about the competitive response. You poke the bear, sometimes it pokes back. And so, you know, when you reinvest or when you're analyzing reinvestment, you want to think about what is the competition that may not exist today, but may be provoked into existing by that reinvestment. And then finally, is this reinvestment what we would call, you know, widening the moat, extending the moat, marketing the moat, or is it digging a brand new one? 
because generally speaking, extensions of an existing capacity, an existing skill set by a business is less risky than just you know, starting a new division and going off in a completely new direction. Couple, another thing to think about, and this is super critical. If you take one thing away from this presentation, take this away. Investment also happens on the income statement. There is a fundamental disconnect between accounting rules and economic reality in a digital world, period. Sales, advertising, SaaS development costs, all have to be expensed. But if you are acquiring a customer who makes your software part of their business, part of their workflow, and is probably gonna have a five, 10, 15 year lifespan, wow, that sounds like something that brings me a benefit in future periods, which also sounds like the definition of an investment. Same with SaaS development costs. When we had on-prem software, but we still have on-prem software, but generally speaking, the accounting rules were you could capitalize R&D costs until the code was ready to ship, until you shipped a new version of the product. But if it's SaaS, it's always on. It's always available. And so you have to expense all those R&D, all those engineering costs, all those developer costs constantly. Can you really tell me that every, the, the efforts of every engineer at Amazon Web Services have no benefit in future periods? <laughs> that they only have a benefit this year? It, it boggles the imagination, but that's what the accounting rules say. And that's why those investments are expensed. So you need to think about the fact that many of these, in, these expenses in some businesses are actually investments in future periods. And what that means is that future margins may be much, much higher than current margins because those, re, those investments will decline over time as the company gains scale. The corollary is that gap losses don't necessarily mean something's a bad business, right? Are some expenses actually investments? And then maybe cash flows are actually higher than gap income. A lot of companies that have negative working capital, they may be generating great cash flow, but these really ugly looking net income losses. And then we have expenses in stock options. Again, expensing stock options causes a huge hit to the income statement, but often there's a cash inflow to the company as the company is generating, as, the, as um, employees are exercising stock options. And then critically, are structural long run margins actually higher than current margins, right? If a company is acquiring customers who are going to be around a long time, well, it's a lot cheaper to keep a customer than it is to acquire a new one. So over time, as the proportion of new customers to existing ones declines, margins probably expand. And so just because a company is posting, I get this question all the time, like, Pat, why do you invest in all these money losing businesses? Um, you know, as, as if, you know, money losing means, you know, satanic. Um, and they're money losing because they're reinvesting. They're money losing because they're making a high NPV reinvestment in the future. The corollary here is that quantitative metrics sometimes are not of a high value in analyzing whether a reinvestment is NPV positive. Because if invested capital is minimal, if you've just been hiring software developers and salespeople and you don't have much invested capital, if your denominator is zero or not very much, well, even a company making a really bad reinvestment decision may have a high return on capital, right? Return on cap ROIC is no longer the canonical test of competitive advantage. And also, if a high NPV reinvestment is expensed, think about Amazon building out a warehouse or building out a logistical network. That all gets, you know, in the case of trucks, it gets expensed, um, but it, I mean, it gets capitalized. In the case of, you know, developing the software to figure out where a package should go, that usually gets expensed a declining return on capital may indicate a brighter, not a worse future. Because a software company or a technology company that's not reinvesting has a static product that's more likely to get disrupted. Qualitative research methods are more likely to produce robust answers here than just looking at the financial statements. Another corollary, limited reinvestment opportunity doesn't mean it's a bad business, okay? A business that is mature, that's not growing very much, that has to pay out lots of cash flow or do M&A, this is not a bad business. It's not what we invest in, but that doesn't make it bad, 
I mean, I also, I don't eat, you know, artichokes very much. It doesn't mean artichokes are a bad vegetable. Um, capital allocation just takes on greater importance as a source of value creation or destruction. You have to, as the analyst, spend more time thinking about the capital allocation acumen of management, their ability to do intelligent M&A as opposed to defensive bad M&A, their ability to buy back stock at appropriate levels as opposed to at high levels. It's more important when the business does not have a lot of reinvestment opportunities because it's got cash, it's got to do something with it, it can't reinvest it. So you've just got to spend more analytical time on that topic. Destructive M&A is, as you know, is usually the biggest risk. And there are a small minority of companies that really focus on M&A, that make it part of their DNA, who they are. They measure the results of M&A relative to their initial expectations. They learn from that and then they iterate over time. But that requires focus, right? M&A, that's just the result of an eye banker giving you a PowerPoint and you know, the CEO says, wow, that's a great one. Let's do it. That usually doesn't work out so well. But when it's a consistent, when you know, it's consistent, small MA that iterates over time and it's part of a learning process, that can create real value. There's a lot of peer pressure in investing. Um, you know, we kind of fetishize um, lower turnover. And that's one reason why I think, you know, in my favorite holding period being forever only makes sense if you've made all the right decisions right at the get-go and if the opportunity set never changes. Um, and then the coffee mug experiment at the University of Chicago that uh, illustrated what's called the, the endowment bias, where we place irrationally higher value on what we own than what we don't, it was occurred this way. So <laughs> Richard Thaler held up a coffee mug and said, okay, class, how much would you each pay for this mug? Here, please write it down on a piece of paper. You know, and the average answer was you know, two bucks. We'd pay two bucks for this coffee mug. Okay, great, thanks. The next day, he asks a different class, you know, they're all still, you know, 19 year old college students, so pretty much the same demographic. He gives them each a coffee mug when he walks in and when they walk in. And then he later asks, okay, what would it cost me to buy this back from you? Generally, the answers were between 10 and 30% higher. It's the same coffee mug. If we were completely rational humans, it should be exactly the same, right? You should be willing to pay the same and have it bought back from you at the same amount. Not the case. We tend to irrationally value what we own. So psychologically, the impact for the investor is that it's hard to sell something you own and are familiar with and buy a less familiar asset, even if it has a potentially higher return. And so I think as investors, we need to act flexibly and we need to think carefully about the opportunity set that's in front of us. Sometimes low turnover is the best choice, but if you are wrong, you need to admit a mistake and move on. Or if you're really right, and the asset you own rises very quickly in price, and there are better opportunities out there, low turnover may actually be harming your clients and your results. Change is constant. Sometimes you're wrong, sometimes you're right. And the opportunity set is always changing. So again, I'm not telling you all to go out and be day traders. My point is simply, let's stop putting low turnover on a pedestal because low turnover is an output of good decisions. That's all it is. It's an output of decisions. It shouldn't be an input underwriting a long-term horizon, right? Thinking about the long-term cash flows of the business when you originally purchase it, that is an input. That is the long-term perspective. But that may result in low turnover, or if you're wrong, or if you're right, or if the opportunity set changes, perhaps it results in selling the business after a few years or six months because the world has changed or because your initial assessment was wrong. Quote from um, one of my letters, um, our favorite holding period is not forever. It's the one during which we can earn an excess return. And honestly, I think that's just a more rational way to think about things. If the period during which you can earn an excess return with the security you own turns out to be very long, super. If it turns out to be fairly short because you were wrong, you were right, or the world has changed, well then, the best choice for you and your investors is to redeploy the capital. Let's talk about moats and looking forward. In a mature industry that generally capitalizes investments, 
backward looking quantitative evidence may suffice to assess competitive advantage because returns on invested capital have analytical value and the past may be a decent guide to the future, right? If you're capitalizing and you're, you're reinvesting, it's not expensive investing. ROIC is probably a meaningful number to indicate whether the business has competitive advantage or not. And the past may be a pretty good guide to the future. If it's a fairly mature industry, that's not changing a whole lot. But that's the problem also. Because if the evidence is there for everyone to see, the moat is probably efficiently priced. If it's clear to everyone that it's a wonderful business and is going to continue to grow at 8% a year or whatever, you don't really have a variant perception. And the odds are you're not going to earn an excess return. Now, of course, if consensus expects you know, flat and you expect something better than that, and you can develop a variant perception, then you may be adding value, right? Um, but if you're just seeing what everybody else is seeing, you're unlikely to earn an excess return. But in a dynamic industry that generally expenses investments, past quantitative data has pretty limited value. ROIC is frankly meaningless if there's little invested capital and if investments are often expensed. If the industry is changing rapidly, the past may be a really bad guide to the future, right? But this, my friends, is the opportunity. Because if the moat is not obvious, if the company is still building its moat, if it's not in the numbers, you can develop a variant perception using qualitative insights. And that's the really fun part. The value of qualitative insight is that the outputs may be quantitative. The outputs of all these things, capital allocation, reinvestment, may, be, may, they, may eventually show up in the numbers, but the inputs, whether the company is taking the right actions today to create value in the future, all require qualitative evaluation because you can't screen for switching costs. You can't click a button in Bloomberg and have it tell you whether customers have a hard time switching from product A to the competitor's product B. You can't assume reinvestment is NPV positive. You've got to analyze the long run economics yourself and make a judgment call. And you can't rely on the warm comfort of published numbers. You have to go out into the real world, gather messy and conflicting qualitative evidence, piece together a mosaic, and make a forecast that may look very different than the past. That can be really hard. It's hard to go to your boss or the PM or whatever and say, look, I know this company has never made any money, but it's going to do 500 million in free cash flow in three years because of the operational leverage driven by A, B, and C. That's psychologically really hard to do, but that is where the value is. That's where you develop a variant perception and create excess returns. And so the message here is to turn off your laptops because all of the information, all these published financials, they're in the past, but all the value that your investment could create for your clients is in the future. Quantitative data is, in my view, usually priced pretty effectively. Lots of clean data sets out there, lots of PhDs running quantitative, you collecting it, pretty hard to beat them. Qualitative insight, that is less. As a go out, talk to 6x salespeople, and they all tell you, well, no, in makeoffs, you win 80% of the time. Maybe you a very small number of investors who know that. Maybe you a very small number of investors who did the work to talk value really is, and I would really encourage you, especially if you're thinking about reinvestment, if you're thinking about kind of more what I would call dynamic investing, to get out there and think about primary research, self-source your own contacts, your own contacts, and develop that qualitative insight because you're more likely to develop a variant perception. Thanks.